So, hello everyone. How is your third day of PyCon going on? <laughs> That's okay. I love this time slot because you know you just had lunch and probably you are refreshed again after a lot of talks from the morning. And so let's start with this talk. Uh, I will be talking about how working for FOSS can make you a better programmer and then I'll also add some insights into my outreach internship with Fedora. Probably these terms outreach, FOSS, not everyone must be aware of. So I'll clear out, clear out all these terms for you and uh, a bit of introduction about me. My name is Alicia and I'm doing my Masters of Science, majoring in Computer Science from University of Melbourne, Australia. To clear that, I have come from Australia. It was a 24 hour long flight, <laughs> two stops. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm doing my Master of Science, majoring in Computer Science from University of Melbourne. And uh, I have worked for uh, open source organizations like uh, Fedora. I did my internship for Fedora and contributed to Mozilla. And, uh, uh, and also I am doing my research thesis on how we can detect fake news on social media platforms. So that's going to be interesting. And I finished my master's thesis this year, by the end of this year. So maybe next year I can talk about that in this PyCon. So yeah, let's get started with it. Working for FOSS can make you a better programmer. FOSS, what's FOSS? Any ideas? Anyone? Exactly. Free and open source software. But how does it differ from proprietary software? <coughs> free and open source software, that is FOSS, first of all, it is any, uh, it is, it can be used by anyone freely. It is li freely licensed to use, share, copy and change by anyone. And uh, it's not like proprietary software. Proprietary software is like Google. You cannot see the source code or you cannot change it or you cannot use it freely. And uh, in fact, open source companies or organizations like again, Mozilla, Linux, Fedora, they encourage that people use their source code, people check out their source code and enhance it. Change the design or just the docs or code or UI, graphical design, anything. These organizations actually encourage the contributors, the volunteers to check out their source code and change that, enhance that. And uh, by this, how, how do these companies benefit by this? It actually decreases software costs and for the users, it, it gives users more control and quality and collaboration. Now, how does it give users more control? If you see here, this is my blog and I have used Hyde theme, Hyde Jekyll theme to make this blog which was originally this. So to change, uh, the changes that I made in my blog are first of all the color, color here, the default color is black, I have red color and then I added those icons at the bottom here, these icons. RSS feed, LinkedIn, Twitter, GitHub, email and then I changed the labels and also it's not visible here but I also use Google Analytics in my blog which is not actually in the theme but you have to add that. This is the actual theme and this is my blog. So it obviously it gave me freedom to change and design my blog as I want. I can even change the font, font size, everything. So it is also really advantageous for us as the users, for us, for us as the users uh, that we use free and open source software because it gives the power in our hands to change the source code and it feels nice, it really feels nice. In fact, you can even go to the Mozilla, if you go to GitHub, you can check out under the Mozilla organization, you can check out all their projects. You can check out the source code for Firefox website. In fact, my first contribution was actually uh, adding this Instagram. Oh, I cannot see that. Um, 
Can I see this? Here on the projector. Okay. So, uh, yeah, you, you have the pointer there. Okay. So, this is the uh, Mozilla.org website, and my first contribution to open source, free and open source organization, was adding. Uh, was adding this Instagram icon here. This was my first contribution. And I, was, and I was so happy that, wow, I did this. And honestly, as a beginner, it wasn't easy because the source code, I don't know how many files it has. It has files in thousands, I guess, 30,000 or 40,000 files. And how I did it is also actually very funny. I used Sublime. I went to find, you go in the find tab, find, and then these tags. I searched, I first searched for Twitter and Facebook, and then I finally found the file where the code for this was there, the icons and redirecting to the websites. And then I added Instagram underneath the icon, the code for Twitter and Facebook. So I actually didn't know how to do that. I searched, I, I wrote in fine, and then I found the file. I added this Instagram. And now this Instagram redirects to Mozilla Instagram handle. So this was my first contribution. So it's not easy. It's just that you have to, uh, to that's back. okay. <coughs> No, no. Yep. Go back. Start the presentation again. Where's my Where's my mouse? Here. Okay. Yep. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, contributing to open source definitely needs some patience. And also, I would like to add, I didn't know even the G of GitHub like two years back. And push, pull, commit, come on. It was like French. Okay, French language to me. You guys might know that, but for me it was French language or any other language. So uh, I was really confused on how to proceed. So this was actually the thing I showed you, adding the icon. It was a big deal for me because I learned about GitHub, how you deal with GitHub issues, how you check out the source code and find your way around in the source code. So this requires a lot of patience, but once you get around that, it's actually, it becomes easier and easier as you progress. So these kind of things you, you can do in open source if you are just starting. But uh, okay, let's discuss some more about it. Uh, I'll actually, okay, uh, now outreach internship. So do you guys know about outreach? So outreach internship is actually a very amazing program but this is for underrepresented group in uh, technology. So sorry guys, for now, I'll introduce some more programs. So Outreachy is basically for under people underrepresented in tech, like women, transgenders, black people, and all these, like uh, it includes all these people. And you work for FOSS communities, like Mozilla, Linux, Fedora, and um, um, OpenStack, yeah, many other communities like this, I think 20, each round, in each round of outreach, at least 20 open source communities participate. So you work for first communities and this is a three months paid internship and I think uh, you get paid 5,500 US dollars for three months and you also get a $500 travel grant to go to conferences and talk about your work or meet other open source contributors and other people. So, uh, and the projects not only include programming, it includes user experience, user interface, and design, even documentation for those who don't know any programming. And it runs twice a year. First round is from uh, December till March the round in which I participated, and the other round is from uh, uh, from April, from May, May till June, May till July, 
Yeah, second round is from May till July. And the best part is you get amazing mentors. At least I got. I participated, I applied for participating in, uh, in 2017, summer of 2017, the May to June round. But I got disqualified because I didn't have three months of vacation. Because this is their criteria. You should have at least seven weeks completely off. No other full-time job or student. I am a student I, and I didn't have vacation. So I was disqualified. So keep that in mind. You need seven weeks off. Like completely off. No full-time work. No student work. Nothing. So yeah. And uh, first time I was disqualified. But this second time in this December 2017 till March 2018. I was selected for the uh, Fedora's project. Fedora is a project supported by Red Hat and it is the Linux OS distribution. So I did that project and I met some amazing mentors. My first mentor uh, was Brian Anderson. He was the co-creator of Rust Lang and he used to work in Mozilla. And my second mentor for this Fedora project was and is William Brown. He used to work, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, he introduced us on Twitter. Yes. Yeah. So, William Brown, he used to work at Red Hat, and he's also really amazing. So, my both the mentors, I think I attribute all the encouragement and all the motivation to my mentors. And the mentors who participate in these programs are people who are genuinely passionate about teaching others. It's like they used to answer my mails because obviously time zones are different. My first mentor, Brian, he, he lives in San Francisco and I was in Australia. So our time zones definitely differ. So they actually take out time for you, reply to your mails. Probably they must be so busy, but still they do that. So they are people who are genuinely passionate and want you to learn more about the projects. So you get to meet amazing mentors and they are genuinely, genuinely want you to learn. So, and it's really important, at least in the start of your career, because I'm not experienced, I'm not that experienced. I'm, I just have maybe one and a half year of work experience and I'm doing my masters now. So it was really important for me to get such encouraging mentors at this stage in my career. And, uh, like I told William, my mentor uh, for the Fedora project, even after my internship ended, but he still continues to mentor me. So you can see you have such people around you to teach you. And uh, in this outreachy, for, even for applying for outreachy, the application process requires you to at least make one contribution. Like any bug fix, like I showed the Instagram icon, Maybe something like that, but you at least need one contribution, even to apply. And in that process, you learn about GitHub, you learn about bug trackers like Bugzilla, Pager, Bugzilla, Mozilla has all its bug and issues tracked on Bugzilla, Fedora has on Pager, so you learn about bug trackers and how to deal with them, how to write issues, how to close issues how to ask for code reviews, so you learn a lot in this process. Really, you learn a lot. So this was about outreachy program, and I encourage everyone, not everyone, every woman here, to apply, <laughs> to apply for it. The next round, the applications for next round has closed, but the applications for December 2018 round will open around in October, I think it, it opens in October. So you can start contributing before that anyway. You can contribute anytime. So next we come to Rails Girls Summer of Code. Sorry guys again. This is also for girls and non-binary people. And in this program, you also work for FOSC. FOSC projects, they are not exclusively communities. There can be like, a there are some communities as well, like Mozilla does, some pe people from Mozilla does, do participate, but they are not like, they are not complete communities, but people can, even if you are working for any FOSS project, you have your own FOSS project on GitHub, you can participate in this program as a mentor. So you can work for FOSS projects and this is for women and non-binary coders.
and the focus is on advanced beginners and it runs from July to September but you need a team of two to participate like you need a team of two and you also need to find a mentor in the same city as you so if you want to participate in this next year remember that next we come to Google summer of code so this is for everyone finally but only for students if you are a student <laughs> So yeah, Google Summer of Code is for students, but everyone, anyone can participate in it. And the best part is Google sponsors for it. <coughs> so you know you have a good stipend. And again, you work for FOSS communities, the same communities like Mozilla, Linux, in fact Python, and uh, Apache, and Debian, a lot of these communities. I think GSOC has around maybe 100 or 150 communities participating so you have a lot of projects basically to work in it and again you are paid and but it is highly competitive as I told because everyone participates it's competitive obviously but it's a very nice program and it runs it again runs from uh, from May till June May June July May till July and the uh, applications for this year has closed and the results are going to be announced uh, on April 23rd for those who have participated in this. So these were some programs which actually pay you for, for contributing to, for working for open source communities. Next we come to how does working for FOSS can make you a better programmer? How? So. I'll talk about my outreach project first. Uh, I worked for Red Hat's supported Fedora project and my role was to develop administrative tools for 389 directory server which is an enterprise LDAP server and uh, I improved, I helped in improving Python command line tools and it was like, like I told you, my mentor William Brown, he's really supportive and it was like, it was on me, the things, the, the technologies or the aspects which was I interested in to learn more about it. So it was on me, what I want to do. So I first worked on uh, the auto membership plugin, adding the auto membership plugin support to the project. It was like developing Python command line tools for auto membership plugin. And my second project was implementation of LRU cache in Rust. So I'll talk about these some more. Now LDAP. LDAP is basically lightweight directory access protocol. It is a protocol not to be confused with a database. And uh, it is a client server protocol and it is used to access and manage directory information. And the main point is the performance. The performance is really fast because it, it uh, the LDAP directory stores uh, stores uh, information like attributes so it's really fast you can index the attributes and fetch the data so the performance is the main point and you store data how you store data in LDAP directory it is stored in the form of it is in the form of a hierarchical tree which is called directory information tree which looks something like this so that is the top level, these are the children, further children and then further children. So the top one, my company, it's like a company name, my company, it has two branches like US and Europe and the US has two teams like HR and sales, Europe has two teams like server and client and then this HR has two users, user 1, user 2 and the client has one user, user 1000. So this is how data is arranged in LDAP directory. I know this must, this is like highly technical thing. So if you don't have idea about it, you might not understand it like immediately. So I have tried to keep it like very basic and very simple. But this is how data is stored in LDAP directory. Now my work was to, my work was to add LDAP auto membership plugin support using command line tools. So first of all, what does auto membership plugin in LDAP does? 
consider you have just arrived in the hotel and there is just one person like Lakapo he's standing there and he everyone comes to him and he has to direct you okay you are interested in community track you go to that room next one you are interested in data track go to next room then he, next one you are interested in web track go to the web room it would be so slow so slow there will be long queues but now as we have here we have placards here placards everywhere which show you that pi community room is there pi web room is there pi database room is there i don't know there must be some other rooms as well so yes yeah, so it's really easier for you you just come in the hotel you come to that side side where pycon is going on and you go to your respective rooms you don't have someone telling you go there go there go there right so it's so easy auto membership plugin does the same thing in a way it allows entries which are added in ldap to be added automatically in the directory server which is based on a defined criteria like you have the criteria pi web room pi community room pi data room similarly entries have a defined criteria and they don't require administrator ad, administrator intervention like no one's intervention because it is added automatically and it is easier to apply policies consistently and reliably across all members of the group so for example you guys are are here and suddenly they decide the organizers decide people who are in pi community room will get chocolates a lot of chocolates so it will be given to all of you so this policy or this thing is applied to all groups of the member so similarly auto membership plugin works so my role was to make the command line tool for this where i had to the end result the end result should be like i should be able to list all auto member definitions create new auto member definition remove edit enable disable auto member plugin so for example this one like this is the end result <coughs> so if you see at the top dsconf localhost localhost is the name of the instance auto member enable so enable auto membership plugin i crop too much but yeah that's enable auto membership plugin there and then sudo dscom localhost auto member status status so status will show auto membership plugin enable and then localhost auto member disable so the auto membership plugin gets disabled and then status auto membership plugin is disabled and here i am creating a new auto member definition where you have to give the default group the name the filter the scope these are the things which are required when creating a new auto member definition so it gets created here auto member definition created successfully similarly remove i pass the name which was of my auto member definition and it gets deleted successfully and then here auto member show so this will show all the auto members which are in my directory server like these are all the list of all the auto members so what did i learn by the end of this task i learned about how to use pytest i didn't know how to use pytest so and how to use arc parse now pytest if you know then great if you don't know it is a testing tool that helps you write better programs and this is in the words of pytest docs and it makes easier to write small tests and supports complex functional testing as well so one cool thing which i learned which i didn't know was pytest fixtures so pytest fixtures is something like some code which you have to use in many functions so you kind of fix that at the very starting so if i if we see here in example this is the actual code from the directory server which i worked on so see this is how open source works you can see the code of the directory server so this is an auto member fixture and basically this code has
has to be used in many functions. So I wrote this code. Remember the name of this fixture, auto member fixture. And now I'm using auto member fixture as an argument in this function. So whatever I get from the auto member fixture, I simply use here. Like auto member fixture and these three. Group, auto members and auto member. They were being returned from the fixture. So I just added as an argument and I can use the return values from that fixture. So this was really cool which I learned. And then I learned about arc parse. Arc parse is Python module for command line arguments, options and subcommands. And it is really user friendly and it helps generate help and usage messages as well and gives relevant errors when there are errors. So like this is also from the code base of directory server. So you can see the thing which I, the dem, dem, the, the pictures, the, uh, the auto member create, show, enable, disable. So here, like I'm adding the command create and these are the arguments required for create like name, group attribute, default group, scope, filter. And then second list where I listed all the auto member definitions. So I'm adding the arguments, name, group attribute, default group, scope, filter. So this is also that something that I never used before and I learned while doing this task. And my second main task in the Outreach project was implementation of LRU cache using Rust. Now Rust, you guys know about Rust? Okay. So Rust is systems programming language that runs blazingly fast, prevents segmentation falls and guarantees safety. This is in the words of Rust docs and I'm not going to talk about Rust more because I don't want Python to hate me. But my role was implementing LRU cache using Rust and honestly I was very scared of doing it because it involved using pointers in lifetimes. I've always been scared of pointers. That's why I don't know C at all. I never really touched C because pointers was like, oh my God, what is this? So I was really afraid of this task. But again, like I told my mentor, William, he was really supported and he helped me. And I finally did it. I did it by the end. So it was really good for me because I learned about hash map, B tree map, how to implement these. We know what is hash map. We know what is B tree. But you know, when implementing, it's it's really it can get complex, especially in Rust. So I, I did this, and it was really good because I learned a lot in this task. And then you also learn about documentation, programming standards, like how uh, what programming standards should you follow? GitHub. If you don't know about GitHub, you learn a lot about GitHub because almost all the open source communities use GitHub. And then issue trackers like Pager, Bugzilla, etc. But can you really be a good programmer just by coding? No, because you need other things, other skills as well, like collaboration. So obviously, open source communities have volunteers and uh, contributors and mentors from different areas in the world. Like I told, my first mentor was from San Francisco. William was based in, is based in Brisbane and I am in Melbourne. So, you know, remote working makes collaboration really easier and it's good for real life when you go to organizations and you work with teams and everyone. You get to know how to use uh, applications like Slack, communication mediums basically like Slack, IRC, GitHub issues, etc. And then time management. Obviously, if you're a student, you know how to manage time because you have assignments, you have your own job as well, like part-time jobs, and then you have to do this work. So you obviously learn how to manage time. And then accepting criticism gracefully because you cannot be right always because I, I don't, honestly, I don't know much as my mentors or other people working at the organization will know. So take their criticism gracefully and try to work on the things which, which they suggest you. Learning to read, like I told the fine thing in Sublime. 
So you learn how to read code. You learn how to scan lines of code and go to the file which actually you need to work on. And then development guide and documentation. And then finally teaching and mentoring others. I think that is the most important uh, part of open source because it feels really amazing when you help others uh, do that things which you were once stuck on. I really find it, I, I find it really uh, good that I help people start with GitHub because I honestly know how much problem I faced when I started with GitHub. Even today I face when I do maybe rebase or merge. But yeah, so I try to help people and uh, help people who start want to get started with open source and it feels really good. So these are some skills which you learn along with coding and I think as a person working for uh, open source makes you really amazing. Even if you already are, it will make you more amazing. So everyone should at least work for open source. Maybe add just an icon or so like I did. But yeah, try to do something. In the long run, it really helps you because it has happened with me. Once I did some work for open source and everything, um, it was really valuable. My resume became my resume became really strong because I had two or three open source projects, and it was very much liked by companies if I went for interview. So your resume also becomes really strong. So, did you get a bit motivated by my talk for working for open source or so? At least try something, and if you have any questions, you can always ask me like on Twitter or email or LinkedIn. Sorry, I don't use Facebook or something. But yeah, I can always help you get started with it because I know it feels really bad to be stuck at some point and not proceed further. So I would encourage everyone to at least try, check out the code base and yeah, basically contribute to open source. And thank you. Thank you, Alicia. We have a bit of time for, for question. Anyone? Uh, what? Can you hear me? Yeah. So, what was the hardest feedback you ever received from your mentor, and what did you take away from it? Like I told the Rust project, I was really scared of that. I, I told my mentor that I don't want to work with pointers. Please, can I do some other task? He said, Alicia. Everyone starts at some point. You have to at least try. You need to try. It's okay. Even I was not an expert when I started. So I told him, okay, see, I have never worked with C. And I'm already telling you, I suck at pointers. So he said, it's okay. I will help you. So he helped me. And eventually, I, like, I don't really understand it that much still, honestly. But at least I know what's, what's happening. What, what, what pointer is. What that asterisk mean. So at least I know that. So I think that was a criticism kind of for me because yeah and I think I uh, when he encouraged me to work with it I actually now I, I know something at least something. So that was good. Any other I question? Don't be shy please. It's okay. How many of you contributed to open source software? Oh wow! Oh. Which organizations? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, if you're already contributors, you have still come to the stock. That means you really feel for open source, right? That's great. So Honestly, I plan to end this at 20 minutes because you know, According to a survey, a person's concentration is only till 20 minutes. After that, people start getting bored. But I don't know, it went longer. So no worries, <laughs> you did great. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Ah, thank okay. you. Um, I was just to thank you for the great talk. Thank you. And also to comment, don't worry dudes, there are a lot of, uh, <laughs> there are a lot of uh, events during the year. One of my favorites is called Oktoberfest that is managed by GitHub, it runs every October. And if you do four PRs on any public project, they give you a t-shirt. 
So even if you are not a female or uh... <laughs> guys, you can do programming you yeah. too. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we accept you BRs as well. Uh, just you know, uh, everyone's code is welcome. You just need to look for an event, and you will probably get a T-shirt out of it. So <laughs> it's pretty cool. Thank you, everybody, and thanks, Alicia, Thank again for, for your great talk. Big round of applause.